welcome you all to Grand Rounds this week. Um, we're very excited to have Dr. David Prezant, uh, uh presenting for us today. Um, it's interesting, I, I keep telling our department that uh, being a general internist like myself is the best job to have in the world because you get to do so many different things. And about three years ago, um, I got involved with Dr. Judith Graber over at the School of Public Health and EOHSI, along with Dr. Iris Udison, uh, both of whom are working on the World Trade Center project in Piscataway. Um, and we were getting involved in a uh, head and neck cancer uh, project related to that. So through that, um, Judith brought me into New York City. I'm, as some of you know, I'm a Philadelphia kind of guy, so it always makes me nervous to go into the city. Um, but she, she held my hand and guided me into New York um, for a, a World Trade Center meeting, which was very exciting and very informative. And um, it was the first time I had met that group and she was kind of pointing out people around the room and introducing me to some people. And she said, and this is probably the most important and most influential person uh, in this program. And she introduced me to uh, David. So um, I actually got to meet him a couple of years ago. It was very, uh, a very uh, exciting meeting. Um, it's really amazing. When I think about the World Trade Center program, I think about you know, the one silver lining is something so amazing in terms of healthcare has come out of such a tragedy. Um, but really what's been built around this, uh, this program is, is really unbelievable. So Dr. David Prezant is uh, Chief Medical Officer and Special Advisor to the Fire Commissioner on Health Policy in New York, uh, the fire, fire Department of New York City. He's also a Professor of Medicine at Albert Einstein College of Medicine. Um, he's kind of a New York person, it seems, through and through. He did his MD at Einstein College of Medicine. Um, did his residency at Harlem Hospital as part of Columbia College of Medicine, and then his pulmonary fellowship at Montefiore Medical Center and a research pulmonary fellow at Albert Einstein College of Medicine. He's, the, he's been the PI and currently the PI of several multi-million dollar NIOSH grants and has published nearly 200 manuscripts on various topics. So um, really, he's, he's one of the preeminent uh, uh, researchers and investigators in this area. So um, today, we'll be hearing about some of the World Trade Center clinical research programs. And I'm going to turn things over to David. Well, that is uh, an amazing introduction. And uh, I've, I've always felt that uh, Robert Wood Johnson Medical Center and their occupational health program uh, I have so many uh, friends and collaborators there, uh, not the least of which the two you, you mentioned, uh, especially Iris, who has really uh, spearheaded uh, the program uh, for New Jersey. Uh, you know, uh, a lot of this is uh, luck favoring the prepared mind, and uh, part of that will be uh, hopefully displayed uh, in this presentation. So uh, with that, let's start off. Uh, obviously, uh, there are objectives, and that's understanding uh, how data-driven advocacy can be used to build both a clinical and research health program. And I think your introduction uh, really uh, helps me to segue into that objective. And then, of course, uh, the medical and scientific aspects that we've learned uh, from uh, this uh, amazing cohort. And my cohort is the uh, firefighters and EMS workers employed by the Fire Department of New York uh, who were at the World Trade Center. Uh, if there's time, I'll give you a little update on uh, how COVID-19 has impacted them as well. And I have uh, no financial disclosures or conflicts except the grants that I received from the federal government. Tons of people have helped with this. I'm sorry, um, to I'm sorry to interrupt, David. I think on our screen, uh, the slides haven't been advancing. So maybe you might want to go to uh, start slideshow. Start slideshow. <laughs> Where is that? Uh, Let's see. You go up to, we're, we're, seeing, we're seeing the first slide. Still. Huh. I have end slideshow. <laughs> it, for some reason, we're not seeing the, the screen that you're looking at. Are you? You're not, huh? Hmm. Maybe this is end problematic. Uh, <laughs> right. and maybe end it, and we'll try. We could try sharing sharing it again. Okay. It's all I'm good. really about this. 
End slide. Okay. It is typical, huh? All right. Well, it goes to show you that one can get multi-million dollar grants and still not be able to do slideshow. But my six-year-old grandson probably could do this without any problems. Uh, okay. Uh, stop share. Why don't I do that? Yep. Um, no. All right. Let's let's do that. I'm stopping the share. Now um, share screen, and I'm choosing the program, and I'm allowing that. And okay, so now can you hit uh, the see the second slide now? Now we do, yeah. All right, but you see, uh, you see the presenter view. So if you go to slideshow. That, that works. That works. Yeah, I think we're just for safety. Just stick with this. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you. All uh, right. So uh, lots of collaborators and people who have really worked on this, uh, both at the fire department, Einstein, Montefiore, uh, NYU. We have a huge collaborative effort with uh, NYU uh, and some collaborations with Sloan Kettering and with uh, Albany and the National uh, Jewish Center. Uh, so, uh, how, how did this journey begin? Uh, one of the key differences between the fire department and the other uh, clinical centers of excellence uh, is that we had built prior to 9-11, not just a uh, credible healthcare program as we treat all firefighters and EMS workers who have uh, medical in, medical illnesses and injuries. We also do annual monitoring exams, which gave us pre-9-11 health data. All of those were advantages. But one of the advantages that is very often not spoken about is that we had done research with labor and management. Uh, so they knew the benefits of research. Research, uh, IRB approval, consents, they were not dirty words. Uh, to the uh, fire department management or labor. Uh, starting in 1996, we had authored a series of studies uh, demonstrating that sarcoidosis was increased in firefighters, demonstrating that the new thermal protective uniforms decreased burns by 85%, nearly eliminated serious burns, uh, impacted on exercise capacity, allowing us to adapt the uniform for uh, better comfort and better uh, work performance. All of these things were benefits that certainly labor and management and leadership knew about, and to some extent, uh, even uh, the people on the ground knew about it as well. Uh, we had convinced the fire department to uh, include pulmonary function tests, spirometry, uh, and chest x-rays, and lab values as part of their annual health monitoring exam for firefighters and EMS workers, so that we had objective data prior to 2001, uh, some of it going back to 1996, and some of it going back even further. Uh, and then 9-11 hit, uh, and it hit hard. Uh, and uh, let's see how I can advance this more easily. Hmm. Uh, what if I did that? Yes. Uh, and this screen David, it seems, I'm sorry to interrupt. David, can you hear me?
Rachel, I don't know if you have Dr. Prezant's uh, cell phone or a way to reach him because he obviously can't hear me. I do not, but I will. Uh, I will get the information. Okay. So we'll get back up as soon as we can. Can you see me now? Yep, now we're good. We're good. Yes. So yeah, so if you if you just go back to sharing your screen, we should be all set. Can you hear me now? Yep, we're good. All right. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back one slide. Uh, no, I'm, I'm, going to, I'm going to stay right here. Uh, oh, God. Why is this not working? OK. So the dust covered responders, survivors, residents, uh, the seminal work that was done on this dust was done by Dr. Paul Leoy, who uh, unfortunately passed away several years ago, but was uh, did all the seminal work and was at Robert Wood Johnson and really added of a lot to our scientific knowledge of what the exposure was. Uh, it was aerosolized particles, gases, vapors. It was combustion byproducts from the building, from the jet fuel, silicates from the building, freon, PCBs, PVCs, polyaromatic hydrocarbons, asbestos, lead, antimony. Antimony was from the uh, fire retardant system in the building. Uh, and of course, uh, pulverized concrete and sheetrock. The dust was alkaline in nature. And the larger the particles, the more alkaline the pH. And mucous membranes uh, find alkaline pH to be in incredibly inflammatory. Uh, in addition to that, the particles are not smooth. They are uh, obviously very jagged edges, which I'll show you in a moment. And that, too, creates an inflammatory process uh, for mucous membranes. 
there were high concentrations. They were uh, all the dust was coated with chemicals of concern, many of them carcinogens, and the particle size varied tremendously, uh, from very small particles, two and a half microns, all the way up to greater than 50 microns. The greater the size, the more alkaline the particle was, and uh, and and. Many people thought that all of these large particles would not get into the small airways uh, because we've been taught that particles greater than 10 microns deposit in the nose and the upper throat. However, that's not true when you have a massive exposure. And uh, these carcinogens, uh, here you can see many strong associations with many of the cancers uh, that have uh, been found with the World Trade Center that I'll show uh, you shortly. Uh, for FDNY, we had nearly 16,000 people, and uh, it's amazing that uh, nearly 2,300, 15% uh, were able to arrive the morning of 9-11, uh, either uh, just before the collapse or during the collapse. Uh, and then by the end of the day, uh, there were another 6,900 firefighters and EMS workers that arrived. So we were able to deploy, oh, nearly 9,000, uh, over half our workforce in, in one day. And, and that in itself uh, is mind-boggling. That in itself uh, demonstrates how uh, successful the rescue operation was, despite us uh, having exposed so many people and having lost so many people one should not lose sight of the fact that over 20 to 30,000 people were evacuated that day uh, because of uh, first responders. Now, if everybody was wearing a NASA space suit, uh, they, they probably wouldn't have been able to get up even one floor to help anyone, but they would have been uh, perfectly protected. Uh, they are given, firefighters are given self-contained breathing apparatus called SCBA, which is very similar to the tanks you see uh, for scuba divers. Uh, everyone has one, but they only last about 15 minutes. And at a regular fire, they will be taken out of the fire. Uh, very rarely, uh, they will be given a second tank. Most of the time, uh, at least in New York City, uh, new firefighters with fresh tanks go in. Uh, here, we were under attack and we could not get people on uh, new tanks. Uh, so you can see here that on day one, only 10 to 15 percent used a respirator. That would be an SCBA or an N95 um, most of the time. Uh, this was uh, on 9-11, the yellow bar would be most of the time. And you could see that less than 10 percent uh, said that. Uh, way over 50% said they used absolutely nothing. You can see how this changed by the end of the rescue work uh, in July. Uh, actually, a successful effort would have been 100% using a respirator by that time. Respirators are uncomfortable, and uh, there were a lot of issues, not about training, but about supervision. And I guess people feel if they've already been exposed, uh, then why bother? Uh, but this was a major mistake, given that it exposed people. Uh, and this was uh, just one firefighter who was completely covered in dust. Uh, and as I said before, but you couldn't hear me, uh, the advantage of 9-11 uh, for FDNY uh, in showing the results and doing data-driven advocacy was that we were the only cohort with pre-9-11 health data. Uh, spirometry, chest x-rays going back to 1996, chest x-rays for some people going back further than that, a uh, blood test going back further than that. We had had a credible monitoring and treatment program before 9-11. Labor and management was not scared of research at FDNY. Uh, they don't do uh, guinea pig research. They don't want drugs uh, tested on them, things like that, uh, obviously. But they understand the value of epidemiologic research. It, we were the first to show that sarcoidosis was increased in firefighters in 1996. Uh, we showed the benefit of improved uh, thermal protective equipment to reduce burns. In fact, serious burns were completely eliminated. And that gave us credibility with our workforce uh, to embark upon this uh, journey. 
Uh, and we enlisted support from all of our stakeholders, uh, both our members, our patients, as well as our staff, uh, institutions uh, before the World Trade Center program really started. Uh, we had reached out to Robert Wood Johnson, uh, Mount Sinai, and others. Uh, obviously, we're based at Einstein, so they were involved. We had uh, NIOSH involved. We had labor and management involved. Without involving stakeholders, uh, and of course, knowing how to manage them, which is uh, important, uh, you, you really can't move this forward. It's a huge effort. Uh, uh, we've had over 100 publications published on uh, just uh, World Trade Center issues, and uh, most of the seminal studies involving lung function, cancer, et cetera, uh, have come from our program. And, and this we share with our members. Uh, obviously, they don't uh, you know, subscribe to the Journal of Medicine, they're, they're firefighters and EMS workers, but one or two actually do. Uh, but we actually uh, send this out to everyone. We published a book for them at the six years and at 15 years, and uh, we're publishing it again at, at 20 years, and that's given to every uh, member. We realized right away that there would be respiratory issues, mental health issues, but one of the things that also separated us from the other cohorts is we realized uh, that cancer would be an issue. Firefighters are always asking about cancer. And if we hadn't designed a program to be able to answer that question for them, uh, we would have lost a lot of credibility. So we had revved up to collect cancer diagnoses right from the very beginning. Uh, oh, come on. Another little technical problem. OK. Uh, so as I said, uh, we have about 15,700 people in our program. Uh, we've done medical monitoring exams on about 98% of them, at least one. We've done more than 15 on uh, over 80% of them. We have very little longitudinal dropout. Uh, our uh, ethnic diversity comes from our EMS workforce. Uh, our firefighter workforce has a lot to uh, catch up on that, but, but we're working on it. Uh, one advantage, another advantage, is we don't do, need to do any uh, efforts on translation. So everybody is required to speak English uh, as part of employment at FDNY, uh, and therefore we don't spend any budgetary dollars uh, on uh, translation. Uh, this is the percent that have been receiving monitoring visits. You can see that uh, this takes us to 2018 uh, through 2020. It's been hovering around 80%. We have very little longitudinal dropout. We do about 12,000 medical monitoring exams every year uh, on this cohort. Uh, these are diagnoses. Uh, over 70%, nearly 70% have at least one World Trade Center diagnosis, what's called a World Trade Center certification, uh, so that they can get treatment for that diagnosis and benefits. Uh, you can see that about 40% have uh, either GERD or obstructive airways disease or upper respiratory disease, which is for most of them chronic rhinosinusitis, for some of them uh, upper airway reactive disorder or vocal cord dysfunction or vocal cord polyps. But nearly all of this is chronic rhinosinusitis. Uh, not listed here is obstructive sleep apnea, uh, where that's uh, about 20% of our cohort. Uh, cancer, unfortunately, is about 15% of our cohort and climbing. Uh, and then the rest of these are mental health issues. Uh, I'll talk a very little bit about it, uh, but it started with PTSD, and now it's really uh, almost all depression. We're following closely the uh, advance of interstitial lung disease, uh, and uh, we'll have a little bit more to say about that uh, shortly. Uh, one of the real challenges in treating this cohort and all the World Trade Center cohorts is the tremendous comorbidity. Uh, it's not one disease. Uh, our questionnaires, you know, usually you, you do a questionnaire on GERD, it's 20 questions. You do a questionnaire on chronic sinusitis, uh, there's this uh, famous questionnaire that's called the snot questionnaire. Uh, I think it's 16 questions. You do a questionnaire on PTSD, the PCL-17. 
It's 17 questions. Uh, each of them take, you know, I don't know, five, 10 minutes. But the, the issue with us is all of these diseases are occurring at the World Trade Center. So the questionnaires that we do for the annual monitoring exam can take a, almost an hour. Uh, and when we're treating these patients and when we're prescribing medications, et cetera, you're not just treating one disease. Uh, I know those people in internal medicine understand this, uh, but uh, subspecialists don't. Uh, so there's a lot of interaction and we are a big subscriber to the uh, one airway hypothesis, which is that uh, sinus, asthma, and acid reflux go, all go together. And that even in people who are asymptomatic uh, for one of those three, about a third of them, if you do in-depth questioning and testing, will actually be positive. So you're in fact always treating two or three of the one airway concept, sinus, asthma, GERD. That's a lot of medicines and a lot of time. And then on top of that, you have a mental health issue from, from many of them, which you know gets in the way of uh, adherence with medications, et cetera. So there's a lot of work that needs to be done to really take care of each patient. I don't believe actually that individually any one of these uh, diseases is any more serious uh, than you see in the general population. Obviously, there are exceptions, but the, the comorbidity of them all uh, is quite a challenge. And these are all respiratory diagnoses broken down uh, by uh, arrival time. And uh, being there myself one, uh, on 9-11, one of the things that we rapidly realized was that a complicated, uh, typical environmental exposure gradient would not work here. This was not an industry where, you know, something exploded by accident and people were exposed to one chemical that was being made at that time, uh, as is uh, sometimes happening in the New Jersey chemical industry. Uh, but this was an exposure to, to over a thousand chemicals uh, and particulate matter. Uh, we would not be able to do an exposure response gradient in the typical manner. Uh, simple sometimes gets you a lot. And what we decided and what has panned out is that if we just did on the basis of initial arrival time, that that would work because those people arriving on the morning of 9-11 had the greatest density exposure and those people arriving several weeks later had less of an exposure. Uh, and that uh, this was a guess that we made uh, but it panned out and it allowed us to uh, treat and, and actually publish uh, a lot earlier than any, any other group that was really uh, trying to explore a more uh, scientific uh, methodology. Uh, so here you can see that there is an exposure response gradient for sinusitis with the blue uh, being the most exposed on 9-11 and then uh, this sort of tannish color uh, being the least exposed. You can see the same thing for acid reflux. You can see the same thing for chronic bronchitis. Uh, and uh, obviously uh, for asthma, which has been uh, our biggest lower, res lower respiratory issue. Uh, and then in terms of annual treatment visits, we're still seeing uh, nearly 8,000 treatment visits per year. In terms of medications, uh, many of you may hear this from patients that you know the cost of medications is outstanding, is astonishing, uh, and maybe some of you have experienced it yourself as as patients. Uh, but when you're running a program, you really get to see the overall cost. Uh, there's nothing that equals the cost of medication. Uh, here you can see, and this is just through 2013. Uh, that for FDNY, actually here on 2019, FDNY, we spent 23,000, I'm sorry, $23 million uh, on medications uh, for these, for this cohort. Uh, that's that, that trumps every other expense we have. So one of the goals is for me to explain to you that this is a data-driven uh, process. Uh, we have uh, a data center and everything is funneled into that data center electronically. 
So our questionnaires are funneled in, and those answers are available not months later, but instantly to the physician examining the patient. Uh, pharmacy benefits, uh, claims for internal or, or external visits or tests are all funneled into the data center uh, so that the physicians, the patients, everyone, and our researchers are able to see this uh, almost in real time. The pulmonary function tests, chest x-ray results, CAT scans of the chest, all of this is funneled uh, into the data center. So what have we found? Uh, hold on, I hit the wrong button. There we go. No, no, hit the wrong button again. Yes. Uh, so here was the PTSD. I'll start with this because most of the presentations on physical health. Uh, the people that were exposed on 9-11 are this upper line, and again, you're seeing an exposure response gradient. The people that arrived later had less PTSD. Uh, you'd expect that because this is the group that was caught in the collapse themselves. This group and the next group, which is arriving in the afternoon of 9-11, had the most exposure to body parts and bodies, uh, lesser than these lines, which are people that arrived days later. You can see that initially about 30% of the people that were caught in the collapse had PTSD, and this is consistent with civilians uh, in airplane crashes, et cetera. Uh, but then, uh, because of their training, because of their experience, and because of our treatment programs, uh, you can see that this decreased uh, tremendously for all groups. Uh, currently, we have about 5% uh, of the total cohort suffering from PTSD, and barely there is still an exposure response gradient. Uh, what we see mostly now is uh, the coexistence or the transition from PTSD to depression, and that is not shown on this slide. Moving on to uh, the physical health issues, respiratory symptoms, uh, the only thing that has dramatically improved is cough. Uh, many people have, call, have called this the World Trade Center cough syndrome, uh, because cough was such a prominent uh, aspect early on. Uh, and this is an average over one year. If we had looked at data for, you know, the first uh, month that we were doing monitoring exams, and we were the first to start monitoring exams in October of 2001, one month after the collapse. Uh, if we did this at that time, and segregated out just the first month's data, it would have been 90 to 100% of people that had a cough. But cough responded to time and our treatment program. Uh, so that now we have about 5% that have chronic cough. And I, when I mean chronic cough, I don't mean the typical, I wake up in the morning and I cough a few times and I never did that before. I'm talking about all day long coughing. Uh, but if you look at the other symptoms, uh, acid reflux, uh, shortness of breath, uh, wheezing. These are things that have not dramatically improved over time, despite uh, a plethora of medications. Uh, so first question is, of course, is it a respirable exposure? And I uh, mentioned before that the large particles did reach the small airways and alveoli. And uh, this is an example of that. Uh, so here is a firefighter who uh, developed uh, acute respiratory distress syndrome uh, in the first month of working down there almost every day. Uh, he was a cigarette smoker, and he had increased his cigarette smoking due to uh, stress and the exposure of being there, uh, and then went into respiratory, uh, near respiratory arrest on the scene, was taken to Bellevue, uh, and we have a collaborative relationship with uh, the people at NYU, the pulmonary division at NYU. Uh, so he was bronchoscoped, he was intubated and bronchoscoped uh, and uh, treated his uh, x-rays, uh, I'll show you in a second, I believe. Uh, what they were able to lavage out from the lower airways, uh, from the alveoli, are asbestos particles, fly ash particles, uh, and degraded fibrous glass. And all of these were uncoated, meaning that uh, they were acute exposures. And all of these are larger than 10 microns, uh, which is uh, what happens when you have a large density exposure. 
Uh, the concept that things that are 10 microns or larger deposit in the nose and the upper airway, uh, a basic concept for infection control and for the development of meter dose inhalers uh, for asthma, uh, that, that falls away when you are exposed to such a massive dust cloud as I showed you early on. And this is proof of that. Uh, this cat skin does not do uh, do him justice. It, uh, David, are, David, I'm sorry. Yeah. Up. We're still we're still back. I think we're still back on the uh, cough graph. So I'm oh, not sure. <laughs> yeah, on this graph here, we're on the respiratory symptoms only. Cough has improved. Okay. Do you see this one now? No, I don't think it's changed. Fuck. <laughs> okay. Maybe. Uh, all right. Do you see the cough graph now, right? The, the respiratory symptoms? Yes. All right. Do you see the next one now? No, I don't think it's moved. Oh, damn. Maybe, maybe. Not. No, try. Maybe just end and, you know, uh, end the slideshow or and, and start it back up again or. Uh, I'm ending this slideshow. Uh, you might, I might need you to, I might need you to try stop sharing and then start sharing again. Okay, good. All right, so now now we can see the slides. I'm not sure though. Are you, if you're still there, because um we don't hear anything. Oh, God. All right, now I can hear. Now we can hear. Yeah. Yep. All right. All right. And now, can you uh, see the, the screen being being advanced? Yep, now it's advanced. Now we see the, the radiographs of the, the particles themselves. OK, great. So uh, I already talked about this, but now you can see it. These particles are large. Uh, and they do get into the small airways in the alveoli, and that's been proven by this bronchoscopy. Uh, this is a CAT scan of his imaging, but more importantly is uh, the uh, slide to the right here, which is uh, chock full of eosinophils, and this was acute eosinophilic pneumonitis, uh, and is very similar to what was shown in the Gulf War. People with uh, increased cigarette smoking and exposure to dust uh, come down with this. It's uh, life-threatening, obviously, but the good thing is that it responds to steroids dramatically. Uh, and this person had a, a complete uh, cure 
uh, with intravenous steroids. Uh, this is six months later, I'm sorry, 10 months later. Uh, this is a uh, sputum induction uh, from a collaborator that we have in Israel, uh, interestingly uh, named Dr. Fireman, who's actually a friend of Iris, uh, of Dr. Udison at Robert Wood Johnson. And uh, here uh, we can show that the macrophages that we uh, got from sputum induction uh, are filled with dust particles. And when uh, Dr. Fireman did an analysis of the dust, it was consistent with World Trade Center dust. Uh, here is the dramatic thing that really changed the landscape uh, for our ability to transition from compassion-driven advocacy to data-driven advocacy. And that's a very important part of, of my talk today. Compassion-driven advocacy uh, is something we're all very familiar with. After every disaster, uh, money is collected and uh, the world uh, does a great job with that, uh, as does uh, America. But what happens is you get burnout from compassion-driven advocacy. Uh, it disappears after a while. Uh, maybe the next disaster comes along. Uh, maybe people just get tired. Uh, even worse than that, there's the naysayers. Uh, they, they come to the surface. They're, they're quiet initially, but then they come to the surface later on, and they actually even think that, that some of these people are malingerers, and why should uh, any further uh, effort be demonstrated? And that's what we had when we went to Congress uh, in the first year or two. Uh, they gave a lot of money right away, and then after that, they really were not interested. Uh, but this changed the landscape, because this allowed us to transition from, from compassion-driven advocacy to data-driven advocacy. Uh, you can see here in the uh, line uh, before 9-11, before time zero, uh, that firefighters were decreasing their lung function at about 30 milliliters per year, and this is typical for adult males, and this shows you that SCBA at, firefighter, at fires is protecting them. Uh, but then, in the months after 9-11, there was a dramatic fall in lung function. Uh, this lung function was fell by more than 12 times uh, what we see annually prior to that. Uh, and for those people that were exposed more uh, early arrival time, it fell by even more than 372 milliliters. Now, this was very impressive, but it raised a scientific question. And that is, uh, what's going to happen after the first year? Uh, one could postulate that the lungs are, are very, uh, uh, they, they respond to time and they can recover, uh, in which case, then uh, spirometry should hit the extrapolation of this pre-9-11 line going forward. Uh, or alternatively, uh, it could be that there'd be no recovery. And then you would just have the occurrence of the prior lung function decline with no recovery, but just further decreases at 31 milliliters per year. Or the third option, which would be devastating, would be that uh, be due to inflammation, et cetera, that lung function decline was even uh, faster than the 31 milliliters after this. This would result in uh, huge numbers of, of, of deaths. And we did not know this. So we continued our study. And seven years later, we published in the New England Journal of Medicine what would happen over the long term. Uh, and this is a busy slide, but just look at it as thinking about it as a single line. Uh, it demonstrates that there was, uh, on average, a 370 milliliter decline uh, in the first year after 9-11. And then basically it's flat thereafter. And this flat line thereafter uh, is a demonstration that there was no recovery. It's a demonstration that they, after, nine, after the 370 milliliter decline, that they continued to decline at the expected rate, 31 milliliters per year, which when you uh, express that as percent predicted, means it's going to be flat. Now, that's if you think about this as a single line. But this busy slide shows multiple lines. And it shows the same thing for every one of these lines, that there was no recovery and that it remained flat thereafter. But the difference between all of these lines is the exposure response gradient. And the people with the lowest lung function were the people that arrived uh, earliest on 9-11. Uh, 
so lung function we found correlates with symptoms. Uh, this is cough, this is shortness of breath, this is wheeze. Uh, this is uh, percent predicted lung function, uh, the uh, uh, darkest uh, blue line. Uh, you can see uh, a gradient in terms of lung function and, and symptoms. Uh, what's the cause of this? Uh, is it interstitial lung disease? Is it obstructive airways disease? Uh, radiographs and imaging did not show interstitial lung disease, except in a small handful of people. Uh, lung function tests showed that this was uh, obstructive airways disease. Uh, this is, uh, again, a difficult slide to look at. On the y-axis is the fall in lung function. If your pre and post FEV1 remained the same, then you would be at a 1.0 level. If you had the greatest post 9-11 decline in lung function, you'd be at a 0.25 level. So as you go down the y-axis, you're having a greater decline in lung function. As you go across the x-axis, you're seeing a bronchodilator response. Right? As you go across the x-axis here, you're seeing air trapping, uh, an increase in residual volume. And this demonstrates that as lung function declined after 9-11, uh, there was more evidence for obstructive airways disease with a bronchodilator response, with air trapping, and with methacholine challenge testing. Uh, but this slide shows something even more important. It shows, again, that there is no recovery. Uh, very few uh, cohorts, uh, even outside of the World Trade Center, have been able to follow what happens with airway hyperreactivity by methacholine challenge testing uh, 10 years later. Most studies are acute, or they go out about three years, and even very few studies going out three years. Uh, you can see here that most people are winding up in this bar, and this bar is no change in airway hyperreactivity 10 years later. Uh, so about 25% of our group has positive methacholine challenge test, and most of them 10 years later uh, continue to have a positive methacholine challenge test consistent with airway hyperreactivity or asthma. We've also found correlates with airway hyperactivity, predictors of airway hyperactivity. Uh, and one of them is the metabolic syndrome. Uh, as you all know, the metabolic syndrome is defined by obesity, by uh, high HDL, high triglycerides, uh, um, and uh, I'm sorry, low HDL, uh, high triglycerides. And the more, uh, the higher your triglycerides, the higher your uh, BMI, the more likely you are to have airway hyperreactivity. Uh, we've also seen an association in lung function decline with uh, eosinophilia and with neutrophils, the more uh, inflammatory cells you have in your serum. So this is not lung lavage now, this is serum. Uh, and this also goes along with some of the new drugs that are out there uh, that can treat eosinophil-induced asthma. Uh, I hope you're still seeing the screen. Okay. Yep, we're good. Uh, we're good. Okay. Uh, and this is another uh, metabolic syndrome one. Uh, greater bronchodilator response uh, also uh, predicts lung function decline. Uh, and we also have what's called the overlap syndrome, which has gotten a lot of press in the last uh, decade. Uh, and these are people that uh, people in internal medicine have known all along. <laughs> Uh, people in pulmonary have known all along, but now it has a fancy word, uh, a fancy title, which is uh, ACOS, asthma, COPD, overlap syndrome. These are people that you can't figure out which one they have. They have a little bit of asthma. They have a little bit of COPD. Sometimes they have a bronchodilator response. Sometimes they don't. Uh, and you can see here that uh, those people with the lowest lung function after 9-11 uh, were more likely to have uh, the overlap syndrome which is this uh, bottom line here. Uh, and the overlap syndrome is also associated with uh, eosinophils, which again, for those people with severe symptoms uh, who have been uh, oral steroid dependent or frequently visiting the emergency department or the hospital, uh, those people would actually qualify for some of the new biologics uh, that have been uh, released for the treatment of uh, eosinophilic asthma and also uh, some of them have been um, FDA approved for the treatment of uh, allergic sinusitis. And we have about 
uh, 20-ish people on those uh, medications now, and uh, they've been doing phenomenally well. Uh, this uh, also shows that the eosinophils uh, in the serum now, we're talking about blood, uh, correlates with the people who have had the worst sinusitis. Uh, we define the worst sinusitis as people requiring sinus surgery. Uh, can anything be done to help these people? Uh, early on, we started a large-scale tobacco cessation program, uh, and we had uh, tremendous uh, results with that. We went from about 16% tobacco users to less than 5%. And in this busy slide, what it shows is that uh, the greatest lung function, uh, the highest lung function was in never smokers. But in those people who quit, which is this dot dashed line, uh, who quit before 9-11, uh, 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 they are no different than never smokers. And in those people who quit in the next seven years after 9-11, uh, they are getting close to being never smokers. The worst lung function is in those people who still smoke. So this, again, shows that tobacco cessation is important, that something can be done to alter the trajectory of uh, their lung disease. Uh, pulmonary fibrosis is uh, something we are very much concerned about because after dust and asbestos exposures and the like, you often see this after about 20 years, and we're seeing a small uptick in pulmonary fibrosis, uh, which we're now starting to treat with uh, some of the newer agents for that, such as uh, profenadone, um, and it's too early to tell whether we're getting any success there. We have very few patients, thankfully. Our cancer findings, uh, and Dr. Udison uh, has been uh, at the forefront of the uh, head and neck cancers. Uh, our cancer outcomes, we were the first to publish in 2011. I'm running out of time, so I'm going to go very fast. Uh, but basically, we showed that uh, cancers were increased, depending how you do the analysis, by somewhere between 10 and 30 percent uh, increase compared to the general population. Uh, and we have found some specific cancers uh, in subsequent years, uh, specifically non-Hodgkin's lymphoma is slightly increased, melanoma is increased, prostate cancer is increased, thyroid cancer, leukemia, uh, there's a small signal for uh, upper airway cancer, uh, and throat cancer, and uh, a small signal for stomach cancer. Very interestingly, lung cancer is actually decreased in this cohort. Uh, and we think that's because, uh, compared to the general population, and we think that that's because uh, of our uh, tobacco cessation program. Uh, I'll skip this for now. Uh, we just published uh, several months ago the impact of our low-dose chest CT screening program, uh, where we picked up 50 lung cancers in about 1,000 people. Uh, and we looked at uh, whether decreasing age from the uh, Medicare-approved uh, age 55, decreasing age to 50, and decreasing smoking uh, history requirements uh, from at least 30 pack years to at least 20 pack years, we looked to see if that would improve our ability to pick up early cancers, uh, and it certainly did. Uh, and interestingly enough, uh, this has now become, not because of our paper, uh, but <clears throat> Just uh, yesterday, uh, the U.S. Uh, Preventative Services Task Force uh, lowered the age to 50 and tobacco history to 20 packs uh, for uh, qualification in most uh, insurance plans, uh, including Medicare, uh, for low-dose chest CT screening. And in this slide, uh, you can see uh, that uh, the blue uh, dots are people who are at the 50 age range rather than 55 or at the 20 pack year history uh, rather than uh, 30 pack year history. Uh, pack year history is on the y-axis, age is on the, uh, um, uh, the x-axis, and you can see here uh, that we picked up uh, a whole bunch of cancers, uh, these blue dots in people that smoked less than 30 pack years. Uh, we also had cancers in people who smoked between 10 and 20 pack years. Uh, these, those are the triangles, uh, but uh, we felt that the uh, sensitivity and specificity analysis did not favor 
uh, in asymptomatic people are going after that, that there would be too high a risk for a procedure-induced harm. Uh, we've shown an increase in autoimmune disease. I'm going to skip all of this, sarcoidosis, et cetera. We've shown an increase in uh, coronary ischemic disease. Both of these, autoimmune and ischemic disease, is not yet covered by the World Trade Center program. But it's important to know so that you can uh, screen and treat patients. Uh, and uh, we don't have time to talk about COVID. So I want to thank you very, very much uh, for uh, listening and for putting up with uh, Zoom problems. Uh, and uh, I'll uh, give it back to our, our host. Thank you very much, David. Yes, we, we're, we're all becoming uh, used to the trials and tribulations. So we really appreciate you sticking sticking with it and getting through this. That was wonderful. Um, so I'll invite people to uh, either put questions in the chat box, which I can read, or people can also feel free to unmute themselves and ask uh, David any questions. By the way, I do see the chat box. Okay, you got it. Can I start? I'll, I'll I'll start while people are formulating questions. So um, the obviously I'm I'm interested in the smoking cessation part that you mentioned because um, and I'm aware I think you work with uh, Matt Bars at the yes, at the NY. Yes, I do. Yeah, so I've known Matt for many years uh, as a tobacco treatment specialist. Are there, I, I, I don't know how involved you were directly with that, but any things uh, that, you know, I'm just trying to think of particular issues around smoking and firefighting. Um, the, the baseline rate uh, is, is what we're also seeing here in New Jersey, relatively n low in firefighters compared to the general population. Um, did you you know was it was it well received and people uh people were happy to get that treatment and were happy to stop smoking yeah i think that we used this and and we published a paper on this with matt bars in chest in i think 2006. uh we used this as what we call a reachable teachable moment so we we started off by saying to people you know unfortunately you've been exposed to a lot of things as firefighters and ems workers and You've been now exposed to this tremendous insult on 9-11, uh, which, uh, you know, even lay people figured out was going to be carcinogenic. Uh, what can you do about it? And, and the only thing you can really do about it is, is to stop smoking. And that message went over very, very well. And we initially got philanthropic support. And now through the World Trade Center Health Program, we can pay for all of the tobacco cessation modalities. Uh, all of the nicotine replacement products, uh, bupropion, uh, and uh, Chantix, uh, That's So great. that helps. Judith, you have a question? Yeah, I do. This was a really um, lovely talk. Thank you, Dr. Fassant. Uh, I'm curious, when you say tobacco cessation, my experience with firefighters is that they tend to have a high rate also of smokeless tobacco use. And I'm wondering if your tobacco cessation efforts were able to reduce that rate in your cohort. Yeah, in New York City, it's, it's not a, a very high rate. Uh, but we are now doing some analyses on uh, chew and also on e-cigarettes. Uh, we had not, you know, been very attentive to that data. We weren't even capturing e-cigarettes uh, right from the start. But about hmm, maybe three or four years ago, uh, we added those answers to our questionnaire. Uh, so we haven't had time to get back to that, but we will be focusing on it. Thanks, Judith. Hi, it's Renita. I have a question. We saw a lot of bird um, incidents of bird significant. What about eosinophilic esophagitis? Is that was that of any relevance? And the second thing is for the cancer. I saw a lot of gastric can or some signal for gastric cancer. What about esophageal cancer? Yeah. So well, we combine esophageal and gastric cancer together. Uh, in our analyses, uh, and we see a slight signal uh, for that. We do uh, see a, a good percentage of Barrett's uh, on endoscopy, uh, but almost all of the Barrett's, uh, thankfully, has been Barrett's without dysplasia. 
and as you know, that's the, the lowest risk Barrett's. In terms of eosinophilic uh, esophagitis, I believe there was recently a paper published, JAMA or New England Journal of Medicine, uh, on children uh, with uh, 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 eosinophilic esophagitis, and that that was a, uh, it was a predictor of uh, or associated with asthma in children. Uh, we have not seen a lot of uh, eosinophilic esophagitis. When now, I will admit we're not we're not searching for it. You know, it, it occurs when it's picked up on on biopsy. Now, almost everybody we send for an upper GI has, gets biopsy. Very few of them uh, don't. Uh, but we're not actively looking for it. There's a difference between a research study and and a clinical study, especially for something as subtle as that. Uh, but the ones that we have seen, uh, we've treated with uh, swallowing flow vent, uh, swallowing uh, budesonide, uh, and it seems to uh, have helped a little bit. But um, we don't really see the the big big numbers, at least in the in the clinical world. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right. Well, I think we're, we're a few minutes over. So if anybody has any additional questions, you can forward them to us and we can get them to Dr. Prasant. Otherwise, thank you again very much. And uh, everyone, have a great day. Thank you for the hospitality. Have a lovely day. Bye-bye now, all. So long.